What is that? Bunk beds in the background? Yeah, I'm at uh, the studio I record out in Arizona. This is set up for like a, a bands uh, when bands are touring or uh, they come here to record, they can stay here. So this is like I have a place in L.A., but I also uh, the guest house here at the studio is also mine. So sp- split my time between the two places. <laughs> wow. Wow. So you're living at the studio or? Uh- at the moment, um, I live in L.A., but I, I split my time between both places. So when I'm here recording a lot lately, I've just been uh, I stay here. So introduce yourself, my man. Right on. Uh, my name's Christopher. I play in a band called the Ataris and uh, sing and play guitar in the band. And uh, super stoked to be be on the show. Thanks, Dean. Thanks for having me. Oh, yeah, man. How long have you been listening to the show? You listen to the show? Oh, yeah, regularly. Uh, I, I discovered your comedy. I uh, went to the store one night back in like 20, I just want to say like 2016 or something when I first moved back to L.A. Wow. And uh, yeah, I just thought your your comedy was like super hilarious. And uh, then I checked out your podcast. And usually whenever I'm traveling, touring, I listen to it regularly. So, yes, super, super stoked. 16, man, 2016. Let's see here. That's like I'm six years in a long time ago. Yeah, it might have been even earlier. I'm so bad with dates, but yeah, I know it was sometime, uh, sometime around then that I saw you just on a like a weeknight at the comedy store, and I was like, dude, I remember you did some joke about being an eagle, and I was like, ah, it's super funny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're like, I just wanted to be an eagle, and I was like, ah, oh, this guy's funny, and I just like, I I picked up that you were like a music guy, and then I think I I, I like deep dove and like I think I checked out you had a record, and I was like, oh, that's really cool, and you were a big guitar guy and whatnot. Yeah. So, but- yeah anyway e- eagle i don't even remember i must have been riffing or something i don't even know if i have an an eagle bit i i, I know i wish i was in the eagles back in that the was day. the bit i think it was something like that like you were I, I forgot exactly what it was and i wouldn't want to butcher it but it was like uh you're like i just wanted to be an eagle like yeah, i don't know yeah yeah <laughs> you, do you uh you go to the comedy store a lot uh, I used to go a lot and then uh, haven't been in a bit, but I, I saw you play at the bowl with Bill Burr. And then I, I, I go to comedy often. I, then I, the night after that, during the Netflix is a joke week, I went and saw uh, Mulaney play there. And uh, so, yeah, I go to comedy a lot as much as I can when I'm not touring and playing shows. That's fucking great, man. The bowl, one of the greatest nights of my life, man. Uh, I can imagine. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I, I definitely have those iconic venues for me that were a big part of, my history growing up like there's a place bogarts in cincinnati that i would go to shows to a lot um it's kind of like the wheel turn or something but for cincinnati and, and in indiana where i grew up we didn't really have a big music scene uh, and especially not a big all ages music scene when i was a kid so we'd go to our shows in chicago or cincinnati so that was one uh but yeah like the, the bigger venues like that like I, I was super stoked for you that you got to got to like play that venue that's uh as someone who grew up going to shows there and at least in, in my later years of my life i was like man that must be amazing you know it's funny uh that you guys are or you i'm gonna say you now because <laughs> you've actually had like 700 band band members <laughs> and it's wild because playing music most of my life it is the most brutal thing of keeping a band together and then I think once you get rolling, you realize, well, I have the work ethic. I write the songs. I'm really, you know, and it becomes kind of like the wallflowers. You don't want to just call it your name, you know, but, um, you know, and I don't think you really had an era where there was like, oh, my God, Izzy Stradlin's out of the band. You know what I mean? Like, there, yeah. So, so I understand the umbrella of a brand and a band name. But it is crazy to keep band members, especially I am baffled about how anybody makes any money in music. And that's the number one reason why members would leave. They're just like, hey, dude, we we have no money. We were gone a year. Man, I got to say, like on paper, the the band lineup thing looks pretty like wild. But in, in reality, it was always like in the studio. I would be writing songs when we're traveling and touring and then we get in the studio and I'd be like, all right, we've got like a week to record 20 songs. <laughs> so I can either show these guys the songs in the studio, give or take the one or two we road tested on the road, or I could just play the parts. And with the Ataris, I would always just record everything in the studio except for drums. Cause I was never a competent enough drummer 
to play what I had in my head. I was just kind of like, okay, this is what the drum part is. So that was kind of how the band worked in the studio. So the, the lineups were generally kind of like the live band. Um, I did have a core four guys that, that I played with during our biggest album, So Long Astoria. And those are the guys that, that they're kind of generally associated with the band. And most of those guys I play with again now. We did these two big reunion shows with that lineup where we played that album, the one with Boys of Summer on it. We did the, the Will Turn and uh, House of Blues Anaheim and sold those out in uh, 2002. And so that was kind of our, after having COVID really bad in 2020 and just taking a couple of years off, that was like our first kind of like, all right, if I'm going to come back and play shows again, I want it to be something special for our fans. But um, but I totally agree, man. I mean, our first drummer, when I first moved out west to Santa Barbara, he was addicted to heroin. I got here. I'm like, I'd never even I'd never encountered that before. I grew up in Indiana. You know, it was like we didn't have that there at that time. Uh, and and it was like I I came out here and he was like, yeah, let's play music together. And uh, it turned out he was you know, battling this really big addiction. And I, I try to be empathetic, but at the end of the day, it's like, I have, like you said, I have this vision and this thing that I wanted to achieve. And I couldn't let that bring me down and, and hold me back. And uh, luckily I found some good people to play music with. And uh, now, yeah, like I said, now I have like a kind of a core band and then I have a, a guitar player and drummer that will kind of rotate when the other kind of guys, the other guys can do it. So, yeah. yeah. You grew up in the '90s in uh, what is it, Anderson, Indiana? I've never even heard of that. Is that by what? What's the major yeah. city there? Um, it's it's kind of like 30 minutes northeast of Indianapolis. Um, it's it's the biggest thing Anderson was known for is like my dad. He worked at the General Motors plant making tail lights for like all the cool old GM cars, like old Trans Ams. You know, anything yeah. that came out of there was either Detroit or Anderson was the biggest uh, auto factory for GM outside of detroit so um yeah it was just a big industry town and of course when all those jobs dried up now it's just you know one of those hardened towns you see in like you know some springsteen song of just every uh you know factory boarded up and strip malls and just yeah it's pretty it's pretty uh it's like biff tannen's future and back to the future too it's just like you know this crazy dystopian world now but uh you know i got a soft place in my heart for it and luckily we were near you know, the Chicago music scene was really good. They had, you know, all those great bands there. Um, got to see the Ramones play in Louisville in the 90s. That was cool. My first show was Metallica and Justice for All tour in Indianapolis in 88 with Queensryche opening. And my dad took me to that. He had a great record collection. You know, he was big into like the Stones and the Who and Sabbath and all the good rock and roll stuff. So that's, you know, my mom was into like Beatles and Motown. And so had a good school from them and they were always really supportive. But then... Through Metallica, I, I, you know, Cliff would always wear Misfit shirts. So I kind of like, what's this? And I kind of got into punk rock and remember trading my mom's cordless phone to some like older dirtbag kid for a, a, a Black Flag cassette. And then uh, I saw DRI play. It was my first club show. And I was like, this is it for me. It was all over. And then from there, I kind of gatewayed into like uh, The Cure, The Smiths, My Bloody Valentine, Dinosaur Jr., all the kind of like indie stuff. And uh, luckily just had some, you know, older friends that were into good music. And they're like, you know, here's some other good stuff. And uh, that was kind of my gateway, you know. Well, Kiss was my first band, you know, in the 70s. I, I Kiss Alive too. I got that for Christmas in 79. And that just changed my whole whole fucking world, you know. But, uh, but yeah, that was kind of my trajectory in the Midwest. But luckily, uh, that and good classic rock radio, I guess. <laughs> Today is the anniversary of Kiss Alive too. Which... I, I didn't know that. I am a Kiss Alive 2 guy. A lot of people like Kiss Alive 1. I think 2 is way better. Me too. I agree. I mean, you know, granted, you had those like extra uh, studio songs tacked on the end that were, were cool. But, you know, like Rocket Ride and stuff, which is a great song. All but American like, Man. American Man, uh, Any Way You Want It, that cover. But like overall, the, li the live songs on that album to me, like I Stole Your Love, There's, uh, King of the Nighttime World, like the energy is just so like electric compared to the first one, I think. But those that, fighting words. <laughs> that photo of Gene is the greatest rock photo of all time. With the blood. It's crazy. It it's is amazing. crazy to look at that even right now as me being 58 and thinking that was in my bedroom and my mom was totally cool with it. 
<laughs> man yeah or that live photo the photo in the gatefold oh. with every bit of pyro going off at once that's my favorite live photo ever so that, good that stage with the gold stairs and oh shit. my god so good like it's just untouchable we have this new song i recorded uh because right now like i said i've been recording a new record here and uh there's this ending of one song where like dude i totally want to do a not odd to black diamond how it ends with just hits and then the the we do i record an analog tape so we just vso the tape so it just slowed down and just like you know so there'll be like one or two old dudes that totally get what i'm going for when they hear that song it's going to end the record so it's like it's totally black diamond on purpose <laughs> it's wild because i grew up in that era where there was big time lines in the sand not at first. At first, it'd be like in the 70s, everybody listened to everything. Then disco came and, and there were these people, fuck disco. And then punk rock comes and it's like fuck arena rock and, and all of that excessive stuff. But when you talk to all the punk guys, uh, say Rollins and, 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 and anybody from the 70s that I've talked to and 80s, uh, the spe- the eighties punk scene, you know, they all worship Kiss and Ted Nugent, and you know, it's no. It's I, like- I'm sorry, no. I was saying I remember listening to some Rollins interviews where they were, or him and Ian McKay were talking about like their first shows. We're going to see Aerosmith, Van Halen, and Nugent, and like, dude, I I loved all those records, and but then again, I also loved Blondie. <laughs> I had the fucking Village People albums, you know. I was I was. God, I was like three years old. So I kind of luckily was a sponge for music of all kinds. I wasn't old enough yet to have that jaded thing that I did get a bit of in the 90s. Because like in the 90s for me, when I discovered like The Descendants and then all those bands that like out of the East Bay, because I know you're from SF, right? Yeah, so, right. So that, you know, the, that whole Green Day. Yeah. And, so before uh, that broke like there was that lookout records gilman street thing like jawbreaker sam i am green day before doogie came out i discovered all those bands and the melody of that was kind of the thing that made me be like oh okay well i like punk rock but i also love the beatles and i also love singer songwriter stuff like you know parsons or, or springsteen or any of that stuff or tom waits and so for me it was the best of both worlds because these these guys were writing songs about like shit that i could relate to like girls breaking your heart or whatever and at at 15 16 so that's why for me that was so iconic so when that stuff broke it was like suddenly the jock at my high school that used to kick my ass like man you heard that green day album and back then i was like well fuck you but now i'm like dude i'm just stoked that somebody discovered this gateway to something good just you know because now man none of that stuff matters it's just like you got something good if you get somebody to, to discover it or listen to it, then good for you. I, I just like want to support artists, you know, but, uh, but back then, man, I, I totally get that attitude because I was guilty of that shit. You know, remember all those like, you know, home, uh, like those, those cassette stickers. It was like uh, uh cassette taping is killing the music industry or like fucking corporate rock sucks. I was like, yeah. But now I'm like, ah, what did that, that didn't achieve anything. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's uh the one thing I hate the most is, and I saw it recently on a review on my podcast are these fucking morons that are like sell out. It is unbelievable when somebody, I talked about some, uh, you know, denim and flannels and the guy goes, took him a long time, but he fucking finally sold out (laughs) promoting $300, uh, flannels and $300, you know, and it, it's unbelievable that you could make no money your whole career. And then, you know, some, you know, you finally get some kind of money. Let's just say with uh, your, your hit cover of boys of summer. And then people could be like, Oh, oh fucking sell out. <laughs> and they just completely want you to be in the gutter forever. And also and the guy saying I sold out, like, like I got some big money from some small company in Japan. That's three people making shit by hand. Yeah. Here they came with a fucking, you know, bag of money. And I talked to it. It's crazy. <laughs> that, and it all comes yeah. Yeah. from that false punk rock mentality. That is insane because if you're playing music live or on a record, 
the once you show or play your music for somebody that would be considered selling out if yeah. you were really the fucking you know that line in the sand on that and I, everybody just wants to play music you know that can get out there and continuously do it and it's really insane that mentality and it's always people that don't play music and are just pieces of shit really you know it's really wild yeah no i i agree i i recently like got rid of all social media and like we just did this big thing well big big for us because we i was always kind of the self-contained unit at least since probably around 2005 we had a manager during the so long astoria album days uh and then after that i just kind of like you know what i, I just I was always kind of DIY mentality, like do it yourself. And I like that. I like, you know, going out, getting in the van and, 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 uh, you know, kind of knowing that if an idea happens, it just goes through me. And then we go out and play a show and that's from A to B. But then recently uh, we started talking to us when Sublime reuni reunited with uh, Bradley Sun playing wow. our old label owner, Joe Escalante from the band, the Vandals co-manages them. So we started talking to them and now uh, their management is taking us on. So that's a really big relief off my shoulders. It's something that that I'm super, super happy about happening. But um, I think my train of thought, I lost it here. But uh, I think my, what the fuck was my point? The point <laughs> is we would all sell out if we yeah, could we get some money to actually be able to keep doing what we're doing. It's not a sellout. It's like, oh, finally. I don't have to fucking do 8 million things in one day Agreed. to where I can keep doing the art. That is the fucking whole point of it. And it's like Sean Penn to me. He's one of my favorite actors because he'll do the big, big film, the Harvey Milk. But then the small one too. And yeah. then he'll do fucking Assassination of Richard Nixon. And that's because he made a bulk of money over here to be able to keep doing the indie stuff he wants to do. And people are just fucking nuts, man. They, they want you to starve and to where a point where you're not even able to do the thing anymore because yeah. you have no money. And then they're like, they, you know, they're not going around going, Hey, what happened? They just moved to the next fucking thing. Uh, you know, I agree. And, and I, and what I think what I was getting at too, in addition, in a, in kind of a commentary, of what you're saying is that also mentally like that shit can like, you know, you're a human being. And like, as somebody who likes to respond or likes to respond to people on social media about like, hey, uh, what do you, what kind of guitar do you use on that song? Like, what is that lyric about? I would do that. And then you would get like the occasional person like you're talking about that would just be like, fuck you guys. And I would just like be like, why am I bothering letting this shit ruin my day? You know, it's like, because sometimes it does get to you. So that's why I was saying it's like, finally, I'm just like, you know what? My main focus now is just writing, recording, and that shit doesn't change anything at the end of the day. It's like that person, like you're saying, they're in somebody's basement, and like I just let somebody else take over the social media shit. And like I know it's you got to have a band social media. Like you got you, I heard you talk about you've got to promote your comedy, you got to promote your live shows. So I get that, but like as far as the personal aspect, there's a lot of entitlement now. I don't know if you get this, but like that, like if you're not responding on social media, then they're like, "Fuck you, you're an, you're a rock star." You're it's like since when i had to write if i wanted like to talk to motley crew i would have to like go out back behind a club and wait or like you know if they were playing they weren't playing clubs when i was seeing them but you know what i mean you want to oh, talk yeah. to a band but now you gotta you find them at a hotel yeah yeah <laughs> but <laughs> but now if you wanted to like start a fight with fucking kanye west all you'd have to do is go on like twitter right now and be like yo fuck you and he'd be like fuck you know it, it's weird how it broke down that barrier between you know, I like that. I like that 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 all artists now are on the same playing field in some ways. But I kind of liked being a kid and having that mysterious thing. Like, you know, I, you know, fucking Bowie. It was like Bowie was larger than life. But like when I met Bowie, he was just like this normal dude. But like now, you know, any person of that stature, like you could literally just to have a conversation with them right now if they were open to, you know, but I think there's a lot of entitlement that if you're not doing that. So kind of what you're saying it's like I, I respect people like like sean penn or people of that type too that you just see that they're just like in it for the art and they just do whatever the fuck they want yeah they'll make the money they'll go do this big project but like you know if we wanted to play a fucking basement show tomorrow and we're playing you know we just played at texas tech university for a fucking thing like i'll do that because i just love music 
And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, it is my, my thing that, that I feel fortunate enough that it, it's how I make a living. And I worked hard for that, but you know, I'm not going to let some dude, you know, tell me that I can't do that anymore. Cause there were, were times where I'd be like, dude, what the fuck? <laughs> Yeah, right. they those people don't bother me because it's Good. like you, I mean, you know what it is right away. They're just angry at life. They yeah. did the wrong decisions. They may married the wrong woman, got divorced, <laughs> they work some shit Average. job they can't stand. And instead of just enjoying life like I'm doing or you're doing, they're like, ah, fuck this guy. <laughs> and it's it's really amazing that they don't you know, understand that they're showing their fucking hand on the poker table. It's like, ah, dude, you've never probably bought a ticket to see me. You've never joined my Patreon. You've probably never, ever, you know, stepped out of the house. It, you know, if the ticket's more than $5, oh, fucking, <laughs> oh, they're fucking, they're part of the machine now. It's like, yeah. yeah. So you know what? I don't give a fuck. If I gave a fuck, I would have quit 25 years ago when the first label told me no, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's a good, that's a good attitude to have. I think, you know, I definitely always try to remain humble and not get too hardened. But when that, when it comes to that shit, I'm totally a hundred percent on the same page with you. Like, I feel like you, yeah, you've got to have that attitude because at the end of the day, only the thing that matters is what you're creating and that you're making people happy. You know I mean? the thousand people that, you know, pay to see you or whatever, like those people, if you make them happy and they leave like enjoying themselves and, you know, it's, or like that thing too, where a lot of bands, like, you know, you'll go see bands and they'll like play like the whole new record and like one old song. Like I respect bands that want to be artists. I think it's fucking great. Like Radiohead's one of my favorite bands. I, I, I love artists that, like that, but with us, I think I, it took me a long time to come back around to, you know what? At the end of the day, if people come to see us, I want them to have the show that I would want to see if I was a fan of our band. So I'll do like 75% songs that I know people would want to hear, but but within the confines of ones that I still believe in. There's like two or three songs that I've written that I'm just like, those are just fucking dated and I don't care for them. And luckily I can get away with not playing those. But like for a while, and back in the day, I'm like, ah, you know, I wouldn't play that cover for a bit. And this was like, 2006 2007 but i was like dude it's a fucking great song i love that song i covered it because when my grandmother passed away it reminded me of being a kid being down in florida when my parents got divorced and her knowing that i was going through a hard time because that was the first summer i'd been down to visit them my dad's mom and dad without my mom and dad present and they put me on a fucking plane saw me to the gate like you know pre 9 11 you like put a kid on a plane you'd be like go on Jimmy, get on the plane. And I, I got on the plane and I spent the summer with them, but it fucking rained so much and ended up stuck inside their little trailer in Largo, Florida. So she's like, you know what? I'll take you down to the Kmart. You can pick out one record when Kmart still sold vinyl. And I picked out Don Henley building the perfect beast album. And I remember listening to that album the whole time I was there for two weeks on their big wooden turntable in their little trailer. And I remember that album making me not miss my mom and dad a little more. And, you know, when my grandmother in 2002 had passed away, I'm like, you know what? I was wanting to cover Don't Dream It's Over by Crowded House. I loved that song. But then uh, I think Sixpence None the Richer were on Low Fair, I think, and they covered it and it became a hit. I'm like, all right, can't do that anymore. But I'm like, Boys of Summer, great song. I mean, can't argue with Mike Campbell and oh. Don Henley as a songwriting team. That's yeah. a fucking dream team. Uh, so I was like, all right. That, I'm going to cover this in tribute to her. And we did. Now, the thing was, is no, a lot of people know this, but we were going to, we just filmed a video up in, uh, Lor I think, Laurel Canyon or one of the canyons, Runyon or somewhere in one of the fucking canyons, LA, for this song called My Reply off that record, which is a deeply personal song about a girl who was battling with some uh, eating disorders and things. And she'd been in and out of the hospital. And the song is a literal reply to her letters that she had wrote us. And we filmed a video for that or we were going to film a video for that. And they were like, K-Rock just added Boys of Summer as your second single. And I remember going like, they can do that? <laughs> like, we never intended it for it to be a single, but I guess in hindsight, it was already a great song. We just covered it with loud guitars. So it was definitely gonna be played. And our a &R and radio guy at Columbia just went and be like, play this instead, because they knew the label was gonna fold. And so that became a single. So at the time I was like, 
kind of bummed that that was the single. But as I got older, I was like, man, this is a fucking great song. I'm so happy that it turned a lot of people onto our music that probably wouldn't have known it. And um, I think the only downside of that is when we went to do our next single in the middle of winter, all the stations in the world were still playing that song. And it was like, we're not going to add a second song by the same band, how radio works. And so that song never got a chance. And that was the song I wrote about my daughter. And it was like something that was also personal, but it was, it was cool. You know, I think that it reached a lot of people and uh, yeah, now we play it every show and I'm grateful that, that uh, funny, funny post note though. Somebody I saw a few years ago in the Montreal Gazette asked Hindley, like, hey, what do you think of that band uh, changing the word to Black Flag sticker on a Cadillac? And he goes, oh, those guys, uh, he said some smarky comment. It's like, uh, because it all went back to, again, watch what you do. Because in 2003, when, when we were, we, I, the band had never played that song live. We were backstage at the the Weenie Roast, the K Rock K Rock Weenie Roast, and they're when they told us that that song had become a single, and I'm like, "Fuck, we got to play it today." And I'm like, "These guys don't know it." I like recorded everything in the studio, and they're like, "Well, you better get learning it." So I literally in ten minutes had to show them the song backstage, which is not an easy song with all the arpeggio shit. And we went up, so I had this shirt. It was this band Pedro the Lion. And I turned it in and out, and I remember, I think subconsciously remember. Henley or somebody wearing a who the fuck is David Geffen shirt. It kind of looked like this, actually, uh, that they had made with iron on letters. So I jokingly wrote who the fuck is Don Henley on my shirt. But it, of course, Rolling Stone were there and they took a picture of me backstage after the set. And that made it in Rolling Stone. First time I was ever in Rolling Stone, a little blurb. And of course, their management, which was our old manager's partner, Irving Azoff, saw it. And they're, they'll never play that fucking song ever again. We had to cold call Henley and be like, Hey, buddy. <laughs> it was, I, I let our bass player talk, but he's, he was the coolest guy. But anyway, fast forward years later, Henley fucking dissed us in the Montreal Gazette. I thought it was the funniest shit ever. He wrote like, oh, those, those no talent guys or some shit. I was like, oh, amazing. I fucking pissed off Don Henley. But nonetheless, I love the guy. I love the song. And I've seen the Eagles fucking six times and they're always good, you know? So even without, even without Glenn Fry, who was my favorite songwriter, I think his son Deacon does a great job. They're not the same, obviously, but still, they, those songs are still the same, and they, they carry the legacy good. So, anyway. <laughs> I love Don Henley. Uh, he is a prickly fucking human. He's a grumpy you know? dude. <laughs> yeah, he's a grumpy dude, um, which is really strange when you have that much money and you're still grumpy, but right. I love that song, Into the Innocence, man. Oh, so good. Oh my God. I, I think I was going yeah. through a tough breakup at that time. You know, I got the call today. I didn't want to hear, but I knew that it would come. You're like, Oh, okay. yeah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, 26 million views on YouTube of that video. And going back to how the fuck do you make money in music? Your big hit is a cover. No royalties <laughs> from that. <laughs> Uh, and then yeah. uh, does the Columbia own your YouTube channel for, for that video? Where is the fucking money, man? I, that's a good question. Yeah, I don't I'm so bad with all of that, like online presence stuff. So that's one of the great things I look forward to with our new management. They just got like the rights back to our Spotify so they can go in and like clean it up a bit with all the like. Uh, there's a bunch of dumb shit like some there's literally some uh band from mexico city that have the name the atari dot s and they're just like techno and anyone searches our band name on there they're gonna they'll be like hey well you got a techno album on here it's like that's not us so that's one thing with the youtube with the spotify all that shit dude i still i still use an ipod so like they will go in now and they'll like you know, get the, I don't know what you, get the fucking logins for that stuff. Cause I never registered any of that stuff. So somebody, uh, but luckily that that's, that's one of their jobs they'll be good at, but you're right, man. I mean, um, that didn't make, make us any money except, you know, it's sold more records, but as somebody who I'm sure knows how that kind of stuff works to recoup a record on a major label. I mean, I'm sure it, it you know, I think the one good side is now I read something that major labels are now, giving those records back after 25 years. So we released that in 03. So in 2028, we will, the rights to so long a story will revert to us and we will definitely put it out again on our own. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I luckily, I feel very blessed for 
that helped definitely bring more fans over to our band that in essence, more shirt sales at the shows, more vinyl sales at the shows, more tickets, stuff like that. But yeah, I didn't see it. I, I made Henley money on that song, but he didn't need more money. But um, yeah, any streaming, any of that stuff, like that's all. I mean, I think that the, I don't want to get in some boring discussion for people who probably like, Whoa! but like the, I think the mechanicals or the online streaming of that, I probably make like for the cover. Yes. Cause like Weezer did a whole covers album and people were probably, I remember reading like, why are they just cover these songs verbatim? It's like, well, I think it's genius. They pick like the biggest sync licensing songs and covered them all. So now if somebody wants Toto by Africa, but Toto is like, give us a million dollars. Weezer could be like, give us 500 grand. And then they get the, they'll use Weezer's version. So shit like that i mean you would make money but I, I never saw any big money from that song but um you know but i feel blessed that like i said it it, it allowed me to uh you know coast on a few more years still playing music and having people at the shows so that's good i take the wins for what they are but um but yeah uh luckily we had one single before that the song called in this diary and that did pretty well and the third this third song you know did get some moderate play but yeah yeah it's it's i don't really think about that stuff it just grateful to be doing what i do so yeah the title of that so long astoria were you living in astoria at the time no uh it was kind of a metaphor for anderson where i grew up but the 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 funny longer story was is i do photography like just mostly old buildings like like dystopian broken down buildings and shit like where i grew up but around when i'm traveling and i was looking for a photo for the cover i do all the, the photos for all of our co the covers of our records and uh I remember taking a photograph of this water tower when I was driving through Astoria. I just wanted to go through there because cool coastal town. I mean, like, you know, of course that movie, the Goonies was filmed there. And I was like, oh, I want to check out, I love checking out like movie film sites and stuff. And I had played a show in Portland. I think I had a day off and I went out there to, as they call it, Astoria. I have no idea why they, they had to emphasize the ass, but you know, ass man. Um, but yeah, so I went out there and I photographed this water tower and I'm like, huh, I think I'll use that but I didn't get enough good shots of it. So a month later, I drove all the way back up from LA to the story, like 20 hours, I think. Whoa. Drove straight, got there at five in the morning and I couldn't believe my eyes, but I'm like, this is the spot, but it's gone. Where's the water tower? It doesn't just disappear. Did fucking Copperfield come in here and do some crazy shit? And uh, I just got a hotel, went to sleep. I woke up and sure enough, it was gone. And uh, I was like, well, guess I'm not using that. So I went to the like newspaper office. They had a historical uh, society at the museum or something there. And uh, none of them had any good photos of it. So I went to this little photo lab on my way out of town because I needed some more film for my camera. And this old man, I told him the story. I photographed that water tower, wanted to use it on a record. But then they tore it down. I came back up to photograph more. And he goes, he, I don't think he even said anything. He just walked in the back in mid conversation. I'm like, this is fucking weird. This guy just like, just cut out, you know? And he came back and he just took this roll of film and he just stuck it in my hand. He goes, you mean to tell me you'll put, uh, you're going to put this uh, photo on the record? Well, I photographed the whole demolition. So that's his photo. This old man in Astoria at this little photo lab. So literally so long Astoria. <laughs> wow. And, uh, wow. Yeah. And, but another cool little tidbit is that the record, when it went gold, I just cold sent him a gold record. I was like, hey, here's this address of this photo lab. Uh, here's the guy's name. Just send him a gold record. So I just like to, to imagine the guy showed up to his mail one day and he had this gold record that has his photo on the big gold record. And I thought that was really, uh, you know, something I really wanted to do. And, and was stoked that he let his art be a part of our record because <laughs> I sure didn't have anything after that. It's interesting. Uh, I grew up in the era where if you were dropped or you left a major label in the 80s, that was it. You were yeah. fucking done. I mean, done. Cut out, Ben. Yeah. It's really fucking wild. Like you were just blackballed. No other label was going to try to pick you up because you owed so much money to the other label. And, and they're like, you were tainted because that's not my band. That's fucking, yeah. you know, Kevin, Kevin, such and such is band over at Atlantic, you know, Kevin Williamson signed them. Fuck that. But <laughs> When you leave Columbia, how tough was it? Did you just think about maybe just going like solo your name and starting over or do you just um, say, fuck it? Well, thinking back, 
uh, I remember kind of how it all went down is it luckily for us, like it ended pretty, pretty chill. We, we had a really good relationship with the label. They were really like, Hey, at the time, digital media had come into play and they were like dissolving from the inside. We could tell everybody started leaving. You would go into the offices when you'd go meet your A&R guy and you would just literally see everybody's shit that's normally hanging on their walls. Like they're constantly removing offices. I'd be like, why does this dude have like all of his pictures and paintings on the floor every time I go here? And I never put two or two together until finally we got word that the president was stepping down. And so we just went to him like, hey, can we, can we, uh, we were working on a new record, this album called Welcome the Night, which was like more of a dreary shoegazy album that we did afterwards. Um, and, you know, we were like, can we just take our record and leave? And he's like, yeah. So he let us do it. I was, it was amazing. I, wow. I, cause I, like you, I always knew of bands that, like that one record you never got to hear because it got tied up in the, in, I mean, how many good records got shelved and they never got released? Maybe later you'd hear them online as a bootleg, but, Luckily, we got to take that album to uh, some other labels and then this uh, label Sanctuary in the UK, which also had all the back catalog for like Tough Gong and a bunch of good like Motorhead and like a bunch of really good back catalog. But then they also managed like Morrissey, Maiden, Tegan and Sarah, uh, and they put the record out. And three months after that, they fucking folded and they said, we're just going to be a management company because there's no, there's no money in our label anymore. And they kept the back catalog for all the old labels. So that album did get tied up and we can't re-release it or do anything with it. Um, granted, you know, I mean, I think that that album, <clears throat> because it was the epitome of like following so long a story, I didn't want to make, I didn't feel like I had it in me to make a record that sounded like that. And I just wanted to keep growing and doing what felt natural. So for me, what felt natural was to get back to a place where now I am a better guitar player. And I, you know, rediscovered all the good like pedals and things. And 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 I always loved, like I said, Sonic Youth and My Bloody Valentine and all those kind of bands. So I just started writing what came natural and obviously putting a record out like that after a successful record that is a rock record that was you know pigeonholed into like that term pop punk which i hate but it was you know to me it was just a melodic kind of punk influenced album or whatever and so following that album with an album that was super rainy day dreary whatever you automatically have the death nail so then the label folding and it was like we can't get any product or any vinyl or anything to sell the show so at that point then i did decide to just start playing acoustic shows for a while and that was at that time where a lot of artists were doing that. And I went out and God, I toured all over the world doing that for a long time. And I just kind of like, OK, this is cool because I could play any song. Anyone shouted at me and, and uh, you know, I, I play a lot of songs at the band. I never really taught the band. But then it started to come time where we're like, you know, I want to come. It came around full circle. I want to start writing some rock songs again. And just they started writing themselves. And I started recording uh, here and uh Bob Hogue, the guy who runs the studio, Flying Blanket, um, which has the old Neve console from Fort Apache in Boston, where like the wow. bend was mixed on it. Weezer Pinkerton was recorded on it. Uncle Tupelo, Dinosaur Jr., all those records. Juliana Hatfield, all on that board. So when that studio folded, he his partner bought that, and now this is his studio. And so he plays Monster Drummer. He played in this really good band called Pollen, and. Uh, he uh, he and I started recording new songs and he's kind of been my my studio partner ever since. And uh, and uh, I just my own worst enemy, you know, sometimes writer's block, sometimes whatever. And I just got stuck and never finished a record. I put out some songs here and there, but only in the last year or so, like after 2020 went through a huge breakup uh, during COVID. Uh, you know, I got fucking COVID so bad. I ended up in the hospital, almost died. And then after that, I was like, you know what? put a lot of shit into perspective. I started writing again and, and I'm so close to finishing a record. Finally, I'm just so focused and um, yeah, I'm pretty excited. Finally have some, I sent you a couple new songs, but yeah, I, I, there's a bunch more songs that are kind of in that world of uh, um, and recorded in the same, uh, same sessions and whatnot. When do you think that's going to come out? Well, the plan is we talked to the management this week and the plan is we're going to put like they did for sublime. We're going to put out one song, in the new year after the holidays that song car song i sent you and we're i'm doing this really really special thing i haven't told anybody about but like my dad was the biggest supporter of the band ever and he would you know he had atari shit everywhere and like losing him 10 years ago was like the hardest thing i ever went through and so like when he died i always wanted to do some really really monster tribute to him 
And like, for me, knowing him, like making him a part of the music in some way was like what I always want to do. And I remember seeing this thing, like you can press your family members ashes into vinyl and give them to your family members. And I was like, can you do that? But do it on the level where we could just put it out. But I know if I'm going to do that, I know there's going to be these people like, that's fucking weird. I'm like, I'm not going to take a penny from this. All the proceeds, because he died from alcoholism, I'm going to give all the proceeds of that seven inch to an addiction charity that helps kids with alcohol and drug abuse. Because not only will I be celebrating him, but I will be helping the next generation of people that were like him. So that's what I'm going to do. We're going to put out a seven inch that will have his ashes in the first variant of the vinyl. It'll be the William Rowe variant. <laughs> and all the proceeds will go to a charity of, of addiction uh, some sort of addiction charity I haven't chose yet. And uh, the digital, uh, they're going to push that to radio and whatnot. And that'll be uh, in the new year. And then working on a full new record. I've got one session booked here uh, next month and then one in January. Probably won't tie it up in January because I've got more songs to record this next month. And then January, I'll start tying up the ones I have. So probably after that, I'd say like, maybe sometime finish the record by spring. And uh, as far as a release date, I'm not sure yet, but uh, at least I've got an end in sight finally. <laughs> right. And, uh, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Can you tell me what that animal is like of the Vans Warp Tour? There's so many levels of that. It's e it's that parking lot. Nobody sees you and you're out for three weeks to, of course, the headlining sections what was that experience like for you? Uh, it was one. I mean, we did it so many times and it was one of the most amazing times of my life. It felt like, you know, every, everybody always called it a punk rock summer camp. And it was a very communal, familial vibe, especially at first, before it got too clicky, too much of that high school cafeteria where like people were hanging with their little sect of people over here. And then the older punk rockers over here at first it was so much more like a family and then you know i think when you started to get all the like kind of younger emo screamo shit that just did not speak to me and you had this whole new demographic i think it really changed and then it became it passed the torch rightfully so so it became those bands tours but then they started to kind of like integrate it more but i think the thing that changed it the most was obviously with all these festivals like coachella riot fest uh you know all these bigger uh festivals or you know Lollapalooza that are or that are now just a weekend festival if you want to get a green day or a offspring or a whatever to play those you could not get that band to play on a touring festival because you would be paying them x millions of dollars every day when we would play warp tour we would all bands would always take a smaller cut be like you're going to get like a thousand bucks a show to do this tour because you'll know you'll probably make it up in merch and the exposure of it and, you know, it was great exposure at first, but in the end, it was like, there's no way. So them coming back and doing weekend only is I mean, Kevin Lyman is a smart guy. And that I think is the smartest thing you could do. And hopefully we'll be a part of it. That's another thing we're working on. <laughs> but um, if anything, at least doing Long Beach would be great because it was such a part of what launched the Ataris that being a part of it again would be great. But um, I'm glad, you know, we, we the way it, uh, when we were young last year and that was basically like warp tour it was just uh you know vegas weekend and right. all those bands and it was phenomenal i mean we played first on the main stage with green day and fucking thirty thousand people at noon it was outstanding so doing that to me never <laughs> never gets lost on me uh you know i love club shows and love the intimacy of that but you know to go out on stage and be like fuck probably like playing the bowl it's like all your hard work led you to that point and you fucking deserve it and i i definitely felt like i remembered coming into Vegas uh, when I moved out from Indiana in 97 and breaking down, going up that big grade on the I-15 and have, having to have a cop uh, drive us back to the state line because we had no cell phone so we could call a tow truck and then get towed to Barstow for a nine, like $900 tow and getting stuck in a shitty motel in Barstow for seven days. And I remember all these things as I'm playing that. I'm like, yeah, you definitely would be making your dad proud. To me, that's like the thing that drives me. So, yeah. <laughs> that's the same with me doing the Hollywood Bowl. You know, just two miles away was the comedy store where I started. And I could relate to, I'm not the level of the doors. And I didn't sell out the Hollywood Bowl, the great Bill Burr did. But I could relate to like, holy shit, I put thousands of hours into this right up the street and now here i am at this iconic venue 
You know, it's really fucking wild when you think about that kind of stuff, you know, when you get there, if you don't get there, it's like, oh, fuck. But when you get there, it really sits with you. You know, you're looking out at 30,000 people in Vegas and you're thinking about that fucking grind, you know, Barstow. Yeah. Barstow alone will make any band break up. <laughs> no, no, I definitely, as from an audience uh, perspective, to see you at the store years earlier, and then, you know, to see you at the bowl and like to listen to your podcast regularly. And that definitely keeps me, keeps me sane in all my driving. Cause I, I love driving to our shows. To me, I, I, I had a flight in Australia where I got struck by lightning. We got stuck in the microburst of a storm and it was like pushing us to the fucking ground. It was terrifying. I've got the Bowie quote of, we got five years on my arm and the plane being struck by lightning. Cause that song five years, supposedly it's his dad came to him in a dream and told him never fly again. Cause he's going to die. And uh, so I got through after getting started by lightning, like I'll fly when there's a body of water. But if I can get in my car and just drive around, take photos, you know, take a couple days to get there. But it's the journey. Like to me, it's it's peaceful. But definitely. Uh, yeah. In listening to your podcast and seeing you, you know, play at the store and then seeing you at the bowl. I was fucking stoked for you, too, from being in the crowd. I'm like, man, this dude fucking deserves this. And like, uh, yeah, super stoked. I'm stoked to see your comedy special, man. I'm I've. Yeah, really, really uh, jazzed about that. What a oh. cool place to film that. That's fucking rad. I've always wanted to play the caverns. That place is amazing. It's fucking insane, dude. And uh, we just got Josh Homme to do the intro song for the walk-on stage. Uh, sick, man. Yeah, he's and, he's super talented. Oh, God. And then my song is on the outro credits. So it's just a whole, like, I don't care what it does. I fucking love this thing. Uh, I absolutely don't care. Of course, I want it to do good, but I've got something in my hand that I go, I fucking love this. You uh, know? Dude, that's rough. Uh, um, well, I, I won't ask you when it's coming out yet because I'm sure you don't know, but, but uh, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm, when it comes out, I'll definitely be the first to support. It's fucking rad. Speaking of Lollapalooza, I got a question yeah. for you. We had that recent fucking insanity of Jane's Addiction fighting on stage. Oh, I love the band. You, you <laughs> had your own version of this years ago with the drummer. Yeah. Tell me, tell me a little bit about that because uh, was that at the Stone Pony? Uh, no, it was down the street from there. I do love Stone Pony. I have a guitar hanging on the wall over the back bar that says, I broke this guitar for Springsteen. And uh, I remember Springsteen, he was on our label and he commented on that. He goes, yeah, he's a good kid. And I was like, oh my God, Springsteen to actually know who the fuck I am. That's amazing. He's but, a god. Um, yeah, he's a, he is a god. I, I, I play a, fi a 52 Telly uh, Butterscotch. It's kind of like his, but but uh, it's the, the No Caster, with the, but it's the reissue. Uh, from the No Caster reissue. Uh, like that is my favorite guitar. If you're going to go buy a guitar right now, especially really? if you can get a nineties one, which is really fucking hard. Oh, I yeah. had one around 99 and I'm trying to find another one now from that earlier. Cause the paint's different. It's way better for me. I think it's just a, a different made guitar, but I really want to get another one. The no caster black guard with the center pocket tweed case. Oh, yeah. head yes, exploder. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, I'll get to the, the rest of the story, but the, uh, funny thing about how I play, I don't know if you know, this another head exploder is I am right-handed, but I play like Albert King or Dick Dale with the low E on the bottom. I take a right-handed guitar, flip it over. I learned all my chords backwards. So when I'm playing, I'm completely backwards. I saw that because you, yeah. you were left-handed, but you're really right-handed, but yeah. so you just string it. Why, why is that? When I was a little kid, I remember seeing Kiss on the TV and I had a guitar and I mirror imaged and held the guitar up to the TV thinking that's how I play it. And they tried to explain, like, no, nah, he's standing like this. You're looking at him like this. It just didn't register. And it just felt natural because I'm right-handed to make my chords with my prominent hand. If I was left-handed, I probably would have played left-handed. But my strumming hand is my left hand. So to me, everyone else plays fucking wrong. I'm playing the right way. Fuck everyone. But, um, but yeah, no, I don't restring. So I would just pick up one of your guitars, flip it over, and just start playing, my, playing the songs. It's weird, I know. Seal plays that way. I didn't even know Seal plays guitar, but we have our own wiki page of left, left, uh, right-handed lefty weirdos. I don't know what it is, but wow. But anyway, the 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 story about the drummer. So, um, yeah, it, you know, no excuse. It was just one of those things where, like, growing up, going to shows, I saw a lot of bands have that shit happen on uh, all the time. Nirvana, Jawbreaker, whomever. 
but at, at the end of the day, you know, it was something I regret having happen. It was fucking uh, days of touring and got on stage. I remember that night and his buddies were there. He played another band and they were filming and stuff. And I guess, you know, it was one of those days we were off in fucking Asbury Park all day. There's nothing open. It's a Sunday. It looks like Beirut. I yeah. think they gave him some sort of pills. I don't know what. I think a Xanax. And he, he's like the kind of young, funny kid. We're friends now. And, you know, he, he just like, what's this? Okay, cool. I'll take it. And he got on stage and he couldn't even move his arms, like jelly arms. And I Keith didn't know Moon what was going style. on. Keith what? Moon at the Cow Palace. Keith Moon. Oh, man. Yeah, Mooney, man. He was, yeah, he was the king of, you know, that and room trash and everything else. But yeah, he, but Rob, was, Rob, great dude. But, but yeah, I was like, what happened? I, I remember getting so frustrated because there was another band opening that I really liked. And I'm like, I'm going to look like my, you know, I got a bunch of fucking bad players with me or something. And I was so frustrated. And I, and I remember turning around like, what's going on? And, and I looked at our guitar player, what's going on? And he goes, I don't know. And we kept trying to play, but he literally couldn't even keep a beat. And so I went back to him like, dude, go go get some coffee have some food i'll play a few songs solo so he did i thought he would come back everything would be fine he came back it got even worse and i'm like something's up and it just like one of those things you feel like the little kid in a christmas story you just felt it bubbling up and i just fucking did not want to hear another beat i just 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 disassembled the fucking drums i didn't throw them at the dude i just fucking destroyed the drum kit and uh you know shit happens and at the end of the day i felt fucking terrible for doing it apologize to my friend cancel the rest of the shows and just like you know fucking anybody who's been in a band knows that you know you're they're like your brothers sometimes you fucking have words occasionally you would get in a fight i've been in three fights in my life that's one of them one when i was 11 and over a nintendo the kid came over to my house stole my nintendo and he swung at me and fucking i swung back broke my hand another time somebody threw a fucking lit cigarettes at me on stage asked the security to eject them they didn't understand what was going on jumped in they swung at me i swung back broke my hand so I think the universe is telling me, dude, just fucking, you know, don't get in fights. But yeah, no, at the end of the day, I apologize. We became friends again. And, uh, you know, just something I, if I could do it differently, I would, but fucking it happened. And, and unfortunately in this day and age, it happened. And also his buddies were there filming and then they, you know, put it everywhere on the internet and fucking, yeah, either way it was fucking embarrassing, but Hey, you know, what can you do? I own up to it and, uh, yeah, apologize my buddy. And, and, uh, luckily, uh, you know, we're, we're friends again. So I think the funniest video I've seen in 20 <laughs> years is that there's that band playing. Now uh, somebody recently gave me the research on it. I guess it was an open mic night and the guy's singing. And then he goes over to the drummer, like you're fucking slowing down or whatever. And the guy's all, <laughs> Oh, fuck you. And they go <laughs> at it. Have you seen that? I haven't. Oh, uh, I, it's I in my Instagram feed. Oh, uh, well, uh, yeah, send it to me. I, I like th my favorite one of that kind of world is the Billy Joel, the the G Google Billy Joel Red Rage, where he was filming his uh, video like VHS in Russia. And they yeah. kept they go, stop lighting the audience. Oh, yeah. I guess, yeah. I guess he was they were lighting the audience. and It was like freaking them out and they would like lose all energy. And so he's just kicks over the piano and breaks the fucking microphone. And I'm like, all right. Yeah. But uh yeah, it, it was, uh, but yeah, Jane's Addiction, I love. I saw them seven times now, and I saw them on the San Diego show of the recent tour, and I just remember being like, man, the vocals were so off that night, and then I read later that they were that they were going through some shit because they were, uh, I guess that was their second show after the UK, U Europe tour, which went really well, but then the Vegas show the night before, they had an argument about, like, Perry wanted to use the dancers on stage, yeah. and they yeah. voted no. And so the, I, San Diego was, re, he was really wasted uh, visibly from what I could tell. And for Perry Farrell to be, I was like, holy shit, this is not, the band sounded great, but it was just like, man, I love this band, but it's Jane's Addiction. I honestly, I like that sort of chaos and unpredictability of rock and roll because it's better than going to see a band with like backing tracks and bullshit that were just doesn't seem real and honest. Like for us, when we play, it's, you know, two guitars, bass, drums, no tracks, none of that shit, just, you know, I love the replacements. Yeah. I love the stones to go see the stones now and just still feel, dude, they're playing fucking combo amps in fucking the, 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 uh, the dome out there in Inglewood. It's like, God damn, these guys sound like a rock and roll band and they still sound amazing. Um, so yeah, that's the attitude I always have. We record on analog tape. Everything is like honest, beautiful mistakes. That's, that's the music I loved growing up. So, you know, it's, it's, uh, 
that's something that I carry with me. So I kind of like that. But, you know, it was sad to see Jane's Addiction go. I like that because those two new songs they released, I thought were the best thing they've put out in years. And, uh, yeah, uh, it was, it's a bummer. But uh, they will not be able to hear the rest of the songs that are probably finished. But, um, yeah, that band changed my life for sure. Ritual was such a three days. I mean, who, who can say they wrote that song? Three days is like probably my all time favorite top three all time favorite songs. Probably. Yeah, uh, look look yeah. at there, you know, three days can't be wrote without being a drug addict. So no, no, I don't it, think so. <laughs> yeah. And you know, when you're young, it's, you know, it's, you go, Oh, I went and saw Jane's. They were all fucking loaded. It was wild. <laughs> it was crazy. Yeah. And then when you, when you pay in like 300 for a ticket or 500 or <laughs> 750 and you're like, God, I went and saw Jane's and Perry's still loaded. Grow up, buddy. You fucking, you know what I mean? That's, well, I think the attitude has changed too. And sometimes obviously rightfully so I feel like, you know, I do understand that, you know, it's, 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 there's some things where I think that for, for good reason, there should be change, but I do feel, you know, I, I, I get what you're saying with that. I, I agree that in, in a lot of times that uh, going to see shows when you're young and like having no fucking barricade and like, you know, you, you know, I remember when I first saw DRI, I came, I, you know, like I said, first show was Metallica at an arena. Second show, DRI at a packed club. I was up against the rail and I came on with a boot print on my shoulder. My mom goes, what, what the fuck is that? <laughs> and I go, oh, yeah. head walking, mom. Like I knew it all. And, and you know, but back then I think it was the thing where you go to a show, you get the shit kicked out of you from somebody doing that on stage and you're not going to sue the venue and the ven the band and the venue gets closed down. But I do feel that the, that, that, you know, that's a, a discussion that I'm sure is it for another time, but definitely uh, some change is good, but I, I like a little bit of anarchy and chaos when it comes to uh, things like that. But I like it to be safe for the people who bring their kids to the shows and all that shit too, because I think the show should be for everyone. And uh, that's, that's, that's for sure. But um, yeah, rock and roll is rock and roll in some ways. I think that a little bit of, you know, seeing a band possibly implode in front of you. I think there's something great about that because you saw something special, you know? Oh Maybe, yeah. Yeah. Well, those guys got the greatest change show ever. They're they never did. going. To, they're never <laughs> not going to talk about it. I mean, look, there's. I can name all the greatest shows I ever saw, and ninety percent of it has to do with danger. Yeah, Metallica yeah. Justice Tour, GNR Appetite, you know, Rage Against the Machine, Evil Empire, uh, even stuff in the last year I've seen where I'm just like. Holy shit, this fucking band is dangerous. And that is part of the adrenaline and the fuel and the fire that gets that buzz shooting across the universe of like, you gotta see this fucking band, you know? Yeah, there's nothing, there's nothing to be said about um, bands where you just go and you'd see them on one night and it's gonna be the exact same thing, cut and paste every night. Yeah. That's why, I like, you know, I, I won't name names, but there's a few bands that like I used to go see where I'm like, man, like I've seen this and every time I see him, it's the same set. It's the same, you can't know, do it. I can't no, do it. Me neither. Can't do like, it. like I will continue to go see a band if they at least change it up a little, not just set wise, but like if I know there's going to be some element of like unpredictability, it's like, otherwise it's just copy and paste. You can see a band in fucking Indianapolis where you see the same show in LA and it's like the same exact feeling and vibe and uh, yeah, that always bums me out. It's too sterile. And uh, I think that's one little thing that's been lost in, in rock and roll that, that I do enjoy. But uh, yeah, <laughs> that's why I stick to the shows where the bands change the set list. Springsteen, Dead & Co., Will Black Co. Crows, you yeah. know, Wilco. Oh, yeah. my God. Okay. Wilco, you know, Pearl Love. Jam. These bands yeah. just fucking play. They're like, what the fuck? Look at that <laughs> set list, you know? Yeah. You never know what you're gonna get. If you need, if if you want to see like with Pearl Jam or Wilco or Radiohead, if you'd want to see one song, they might you might look at like Setlist FM and they might play it on the Wednesday. But if you go see them on Thursday, you might get a totally different set. I think that's cool. You know, I think I it's, it. it's, yeah, it's nice if there's like the, even the Stones. Like there's a few songs they rotate out, and I thought that was cool. Like I saw them at the Rose Bowl, and they, I finally saw Dead Flowers. I thought that was great. But then you know I saw them at the last time. I finally saw Beast of Burden. There's sometimes you'll get something special, at least if you're doing that. Um, yeah, you got the yeah. silver, Moonlight yeah, Mile, cool. these crazy deep tracks. Oh, man. I love it. My all time favorite records are those, you know, those, the trifecta of like, you know, Sticky Fingers, Baker's Banquet, Ex Exile on Main Street, and Let It Bleed. Like, well, that trifecta, that's the four. Like, holy shit. To have those four albums, like, 
that many years apart? Like, well, they're like all like one year apart. That's insanity. Like, oh my God. I don't even know who Mick Jagger was that he wrote those lyrics because later, and I love Jagger, but later he just, you know, he got pretty lazy, like, you know, it's cold. <laughs> she fell in love. Now I'm hot. Now I'm old. You know, it's just like, oh, yeah. hey, dude, how did you write fucking Can't You Hear Me Knocking? How did you write fucking sympathy for the devil? How did you write fucking moonlight mile? You know, sometimes it's just lightning in a bottle. That's you know, what like, it is. That's yeah, what it is. Creativity, man. I agree. Like when I think about it and like some of the songs that I've written that I think that are, are most relatable to people are ones that I couldn't write again today. If I tried, I feel I can sit down with a guitar and sometimes have that sort of lightning in a bottle thing happen with something new. And I'm always grateful when it does. Like there's one of these new songs I wrote where I literally woke up out of a dream and I had the full melody, the guitar part, everything in my head. And I'm like, all right, I better get my voice memos app and just hum this shit in the phone because I, this doesn't happen that often. Right. So I think one thing that happens as you get older, like obviously you get a little, you know, my life now, I feel in a lot of ways, I mean, I'm a very like, creature of habit OCD dude so I'm very just content and happy in life so when I moved to Santa Barbara and I'm like living in my van and I literally was living in my van parked in front of our now bass player's house because I had no place to live I and mean, you're going through all this like tumult and like torment and struggle I think there's a certain way that you're just trying to trying to like work shit out that like you're never quite comfortable and I think being comfortable content is good on some level but if you get too settled in it's almost bad. And I think you've got to find a, a good, happy medium between those things. As a writer, um, it's good to have some stability in life, but also if you want to keep those kind of creative things flowing, I mean, I don't know. Like, I, I just can't. I, there are those artists, like, I don't understand how they write such an amazing late life record. Like, look at Bowie, look at Springsteen. There's some of those later life albums or like Petty, like, you know, like those are, those are artists from like, how did you write? you know, Black Star or fucking Wildflowers or, or fucking uh, Magic, I think is a great Springsteen album. Everybody likes the Rising, or no, uh, there's a- uh, Ghost of Tom Joad for me, which yeah. is deep in his career. Incredible, you know? incredible. That's like, how do you write that when you have everything in the world? And you, I mean, does it, I guess it means, at least what I get out of it is not, no one is immune to like heartbreak and go losing a family member, losing a pet, losing, you know, when I lost my last dog, Gracie, I like immediately like went inward. But after that, when you're processing that shit or when I lost my dad, you just write and write and write. Or like when I almost died with COVID, like at the time, like everybody was like, hey, man, you must be writing a lot. You got all this time off. Like, I'm not writing shit because I literally just went through this thing and I went through a breakup. But then after I came through all that and I started getting back to a place where I, I was creative again, then I felt like, all right, now I've processed all this shit. What does it mean? How do I make this into something positive and turn it into something that can inspire or just be some sort of cathartic thing for me? But um, so, yeah, I think you can you can get that even at times in your life where maybe to everyone else like the Jagger, you know, he, he's obviously, you know, the guy's fucking one of the richest people in the world and this incredible writer who's probably done everything. But, you know, he's had some late like I think that new Stones album is fucking great. I mean, oh, that Stone song with Gaga. Oh, my God. Killer. Yeah. There's a lot of killer songs on that album. I was really impressed. I was like, God damn, that's fucking cool to be that band and to come out of left field with that and, and uh, just do this incredible record. I mean, Pearl Jam are still doing it. There's so many good bands that, that I'm, I'm always really amazed. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, <laughs> like I can only dream. But I think what, you know, what I'm writing now, at least, you know, I'll never be one to give myself a compliment or toot my own horn, but I do feel like any fans of our band, it is it feels like the Ataris that people loved, but a grown up version of it next, you know, the, the next day from our so long story album, but like, you know, 20 years later, if that yeah. makes any sense, you know, there's a lot of the good, like uh, guitar kind of element stuff that, you know, I've grown with and, and uh, as being a better player, but then there's at the core of any good song for me, it's just being a good storyteller and singer songwriter and having lyrics that are uh, these vivid narratives and things that I love with artists that I'm into. And uh, I feel it's got a lot of that. At least what I've written so far, I mean, you know, there's a lot more to be done, but uh, so far so good. 
Well, great talking to you, man. Yeah. Looking forward to hearing the record. And you too. Let really me good. know when you're in town. Come see some comedy and I'd, we'll hang I'd, out. I'd love that. Yeah, I'd love that, man. That'd be great. And uh, yeah, if, I can, you ever, if you ever want to, I, I know you've, you've played with a, a couple artists and I've, I, I've heard you say mixed things about playing with bands. But when we played the Wiltern last time, I'm like, man, I wonder if Dean would be into playing. But like, you know, if there's ever a time you'd want to play with us or something, I'd fucking love to have you or something. That'd be super killer. Or if you ever need a you ever need a guitar player for your uh, your ACDC thing, I'm the biggest Bond era fan or anything. I'd fuck. <laughs> Hell yeah. Hit, yeah, hit me up, dude, for right sure. On. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it, brother. Oh man, great to have you on and yeah. look forward to the new record. And um I will see you soon when you're back in LA. Right on. And thank you so much, man. Look look forward to it. And thanks again for having me on and look forward to your special. Candles lit, brother. Cheers. Candles lit. Bye-bye. Yeah.